Part 1. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 6. Good afternoon, East Coast Community College. How may I help you? Good afternoon. My name's Sonia Stamp. I wonder if you could give me some information about your courses? Certainly. And perhaps help me make a choice? I'll see what I can do. What were you thinking of studying, Sonia? Well, a while ago I started a bachelor's degree in accounting, but I only completed the first year. I'd like to study again, only this time something a bit more creative. Then you've come to the right place. We've got courses in drawing, painting, photography, music, dance and drama. I'm not sure I could make a career out of those, although I'm not bad at drawing. Yes, it's not easy to earn a living as an artist. Still, if you like drawing, why not consider graphic design or desktop publishing? To tell the truth, I'm not sure what desktop publishing is. It's creating leaflets or brochures for advertising, or even entire books. You manipulate the text and images on your computer. We've got some really good tutors on that course, and lots of our students get work afterwards. That sounds interesting. Where could I study desktop publishing? There's a beginner's course at East Lakes, and we've just started one at the Randwick Community Centre. Really? That's close by. I could walk from home. Wait a minute. The Randwick course is a series of weekend workshops. You'd have to give up Saturdays and Sundays. Oh, that's no good. I waitress on Saturday and I need that income. Tell me about the course at East Lakes. East Lakes? Oh, sorry, that course has been filled and there are already two people on the waiting list. No problem. Have you thought about web design? Yes, I have. My cousin, who makes jewellery, wants to set up an online business. We've been talking about setting up our own website for ages. Because these courses are so popular, you'd have to pay straight away. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 7 to 10. So, Sonia, you've chosen web design. Yes. Just one more thing. How familiar would I need to be with computers before I start? According to the information here, you need good keyboarding skills and a working knowledge of the Windows environment. I've got both of those, but I'm not sure about my cousin. I'd like to study web design at your Randwick Centre. Is that possible? I'm afraid our courses there are full. Another option is a daytime class. Do you have any commitments on weekdays? I'm busy on Mondays and Tuesdays. OK. There's a course at Daisyville on Fridays at noon for two hours. It runs from August to November for 13 weeks. That's a fairly long time, 13 weeks. I mean, long enough to really learn something. Yes, I agree. So, shall I put you down for web design at Daisyville? Ah, I'm new to this area and I'm not sure where Daisyville is. Could you spell it for me and I'll look it up? It's Daisyville. D-A-C-E-Y-V-I-L-L-E. Thanks. Is it easy to get to by bus from Randwick? 
The 400 bus stops right outside the school where the course is held and the service runs until midnight. Great. One last question. My cousin's a pensioner. Would she get a discount? Yes, there's 20% off for full-time students or pensioners. She'll just have to bring her pension card to the first class. No problem. Speaking of cards, I've got my credit card here. I'd like to pay. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a man talking about 28-day tours that his company organises for students. Before you listen, you have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 15. Welcome to Go16, the adventure tour company for high school students. I've met some of you young people before our last meeting, and I'm glad your parents could make it tonight. Let's get started. You probably know that our company takes students aged 16 to 18 to around 40 destinations worldwide. Our maximum group size is 14, and we're away for 28 days. We usually go in the long summer vacation, but a couple of groups go in winter. Last year, Go16 groups visited China, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Peru. Sorry, not Indonesia, Malaysia. And this year, we're adding Ukraine. That'll be a winter trip because Kiev is gorgeous in the snow, but the climate brings additional challenges. But what you may not know is that Go16 is no ordinary business. We're as concerned about social responsibility as traveling. Of course, we go to beaches and restaurants like ordinary tourists, but every Go16 tour must include three things. Firstly, students learn some of the local language through a 10-day stay with a family. Then, they go on a trek. In Peru, we climb for three days in the mountains up to Machu Picchu. It's fantastic. Lastly, Go16 students volunteer for two weeks for a community organization. Before you listen to the rest of the talk, you have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. While I'm on this topic of volunteering, our Go16 group in China in 2009 took part in an environmental project to prevent the desert spreading. Our students saw the Great Wall and the Forbidden City in Beijing first. Then they flew 3,000 kilometers west to Kashgar. They assisted scientists from a well-known research institute with laying plastic netting in the Taklamakan Desert. Over time, seeds are caught in this netting and eventually plants grow to create a barrier against sand. In 2012, another Go16 group went to see the progress and they were amazed. Grasses, bushes, and even trees had grown that stopped the desert spreading. I can hear your mothers thinking, laying plastic netting in the Chinese desert? That doesn't sound safe or educational. Why would my child be doing that? As to the safety, Go16 has very good insurance. 
all our staff is bilingual and familiar with local conditions. Furthermore, we follow New York State health and safety regulations in every country we're in. Concerning the educational value of the Desert Project, I think all of those GO16 students got straight A's in biology and geography back home. Perhaps you're wondering, what does all this cost? GO16 has two packages, which you can read about in the brochure I'll pass round. Since the kids raise some of the money themselves, it's less expensive than you might think. As I said before, we've added Ukraine this year. We chose this country because the history of Eastern Europe is now part of the school curriculum. Some of you here tonight might be studying the communist period and the breakup of the former Soviet Union. Many Americans also have family members from there. Lastly, I was born in Kiev, the capital, so I'm Ukrainian-American. I can give a special insight into the country and culture. Now, I said earlier that Ukraine is lovely in winter. However, some of the community projects GO16 will be involved with are connected to AIDS and drug use. These may be challenging for teenagers. In my opinion, the world is a complex place, and understanding complexity is an important part of education. Of course, GO16's tours are fun. Trekking is fantastic fun, but they're also about personal development and understanding our ever-changing world. Now it's your turn. Any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a university lecturer and two students discussing an assignment. Before you listen, you have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 25. Come in, gentlemen. How can I help you? Good afternoon, Dr. Anderson. Chen and I are students in your research methods class, and we're having some problems with our assignment. Yes, you told me that on the phone. What was your topic again? Food issues related to living in space. What exactly are you finding difficult? We can't find much information, and our presentation's in two weeks' time. We've done all the usual things. Look online. Go to the library. We've even contacted the ESA. The European Space Agency? Yes, for its 2012 report. Well done. What have you learnt so far? Not much, I'm afraid. It's going to take three weeks for the report to get to us. Too late for our presentation. You can still use the data in your essays. By the way, how have you defined your topic? It needs to be clearer and more specific. I mean, food issues in space is a pretty big area. We've decided on the nutritional value of food and the cost of food. And food preferences, whether astronauts like chocolate or strawberry ice cream, for example. What about the social aspects? Can you sit down to a meal together in a rocket? Apparently, astronauts did in Skylab in 1973, and they do at the ISS, the International Space Station. We're focusing on the International Space Station rather than rockets. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 26 to 30.
All right. Now, you may not like this, but I find your considerations minor. Your research areas aren't that interesting or academic. How about looking into the future? How could agriculture, for example, be developed in space? Well, as far as we know, there's no planet in our solar system with an atmosphere suitable to sustaining life. That's any kind of life, human or plant. What about setting up an artificial environment? You might remember the experiments in greenhouse production here on Earth. There was a major one in Texas in 2006, and there's another underway in the south of England. The ESA should mention that. That's an idea. Of course, an alternative is importing food until a colony can produce its own. That's what I meant about the cost. Flying food into space is very expensive, not to mention all the waste produced. Around 25% of the weight of food products for astronauts at the ISS is packaging. OK. Why don't you examine the logistics of sending food into space and bringing back the waste? Do all the maths on it since you're engineering students. This could be interesting. I've seen a couple of articles already on feeding groups of people who are far from home. Like soldiers? Exactly. There have been lots of PhDs on the Vietnam War and food logistics. The use of container ships began then as a response to supplying so many men. Anyway, isn't it likely that moons or planets outside our solar system will be better for growing food? I think around 400 exoplanets are in the habitable zone, not too far for us to travel to. When might these be explored? We're still waiting for the ESA report. All right. I'd like you to spend tonight refining your research topic. Come back to me tomorrow. You've done some good work, but you need to focus. At this level of your studies, you should try to become experts. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. We'll see you tomorrow. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about an island near Antarctica called Macquarie Island. Before you listen, to read questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today's lecture is on Macquarie Island. We'll be using this island for our next assignment in which I'd like you to write a practice proposal for a research grant there. Macquarie Island is halfway between the Australian mainland and Antarctica. To be precise, it's 1,500 kilometres south-southeast of Tasmania. It's quite a small island, only 128 square kilometres, but its geological value is immense. In 1997, it was made a UNESCO World Heritage Site for this reason. Macquarie Island is the only place on Earth where rocks from the mantle are exposed above sea level. Macquarie Ridge, which the island is part of, is right between two tectonic plates, the Indo-Australian and the Pacific. As you may imagine, earthquakes are common. One in 2004 registered 8.1 on the Richter scale. Luckily, there was no loss of human life. 
Discovered by Frederick Hasselborough in 1810, Macquarie Island was named after the Governor of New South Wales, a British colony which is now an Australian state. Hasselborough was looking for seals to kill. In those days, seal skin and blubber, or fat, were in great demand. They were used around the world for clothing and heating. It was Hasselborough's lucky day when he found Macquarie Island, since there were possibly a million animals there. Hasselborough and his men slaughtered as many seals as possible, boiled down their blubber and shipped it back to Australia. This industry continued for over a century. Both the seals and penguins were very nearly made extinct. After sealing ended, Macquarie Island became a nature reserve and a giant science lab. At present, there are no permanent inhabitants and only 40 people, nearly all scientists, stay there temporarily. There's been an Antarctic base there since 1948. I think it's now called the Australian Antarctic Division. But back to some unfortunate events. In 1810, by accident, Hasselborough carried rats on his ships. Deliberately, he brought rabbits to feed his workers. Later, cats were introduced to kill the rats, but the cats bred like rabbits. By the 1950s, there were huge rat, cat and rabbit populations. It is believed the cats killed 60,000 seabirds each year. From 1985 to 2000, more than 2,500 cats were destroyed by park staff. Rabbits don't eat birds, but they do cause erosion. Landslides, caused by rabbits, have reduced the area where birds make their nests. In 2007, a seven-year plan to rid the island of rabbits was put into action. So, what areas might your research proposals cover? Well, the geology of Macquarie Island is unique. Seismology is another possibility. There are also meteorological and magnetic stations for weather reporting. There's been a long-term study on rising temperatures collected by these stations, which has been fundamental in our understanding of global warming. Animal life is abundant. More than 80,000 elephant seals call this place home. There are flocks of rare birds, including six penguin and four albatross species. In fact, it's estimated that 3.5 million seabirds breed on Macquarie Island each year. Studying animal populations might be worthwhile. But the big money these days is in pest control. 24 million Australian dollars, to be precise, are going towards this, so you'd have to be crazy not to get in on the act. What about the island's flora? Plants share an affinity with those of southern New Zealand rather than mainland Australia. Yet, due to the bitter wind, none grows more than a metre high and woody plants are absent. If you're curious about mosses or bushes, then this could be the place for you. Anyway, whether you're into weather patterns, earthquakes, seals, birds or strange plants, scientific research on Macquarie Island certainly sounds exciting. Research one specific area this week and in tutorials next week, we'll look at how to write up a research proposal and what its budget might be. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.